So at 7 o'clock in the morning, for the last 32 years, during the breeding season for Magellanic penguins, that's what wakes me up. <laughs> when you spend a lot of time amongst penguins, and at Punta Tombo, the place I'm going to tell you about today, there's around 200,000 breeding pairs of penguins. So it's like living in Penguin City. And one of the things that happened to me over the years, so there's been 32 of them, it's changed how I view the world. And the question that I continue to ask myself is, should penguins pay our bills? So the place that I work, Punta Tombo, is a little spit of land that sticks out into the South Atlantic. And this is where the 200,000 pairs of breeding penguins live. They breed there, but they don't spend the winters there. That's why I go to Argentina, as you know, in our winters. So they migrate from Punta Tombo, and they go all the way up to Brazil, and then they turn around, and then in the spring, they come back to Punta Tombo and other colonies further south to breed. So it's an incredible migration. These penguins go more than 1,000 kilometers in each way. So they really tell us a lot about our ocean. When I first went there, actually, in 1982, but I don't have a picture of me younger than this, um, I was really interested in the penguins, but the reason I went is because a company wanted to harvest them, and they wanted to turn the penguins into gloves. Now, the reason that they wanted to do this is because that's how you make money. Because penguins didn't have any value alive, but if you can kill them and turn them into some product, then they suddenly had value. And I thought that penguins had a lot more value alive than dead. And in fact, now we have something like 100,000 people visiting Punta Tombo every year. They buy all kinds of, mem of penguin mem memorabilia. They hire guides. They buy not only tchotchke, but they buy books. Then they buy t-shirts. So there's really a whole economic industry around seeing live penguins. So they are much more valuable now, alive than dead, and nobody's talking about making gloves out of penguins. But my point is, that's what economists call an externality. An externality means that it doesn't cost you anything. And of course, penguins were free. So if you could harvest them and take them and make something out of them, you could make a profit. But of course, killing penguins is not exactly what the penguins want. So penguins would be subsidizing the gloves. And in fact, most all the products, if you look on average, every product that's sold, about for every dollar that the company makes, 41 cents is subsidized by nature. You know, whether it would be golf gloves for penguins or whether it's uh, trees that are cut down to make houses. Nature subsidizes heavily many of our products, and so some of them much more heavily than other ones. Now I look at penguins a number of years later and say, they've told us a lot about the environment. They're really ocean sentinels. They're marine sentinels telling us what's happening to our oceans. And of course, 72% of our planet is covered in water. Not only are they telling us about the planet, but we've learned a lot about penguins over the last 30 plus years. We know, for example, that individual penguins in the wild live more than 30 years. We know that they can swim more than 100 miles in a day. That's better than Michael Phelps. And not only that, they can swim at the same speed day and night because they're in such a hurry to come back and feed their chicks. How do you get long-term studies like this? Government doesn't fund them. Universities don't fund them. Who funds them are really interested individuals. So I'm grateful to the Wadsworth Endowed Chair in Conservation Science because that gift to the University of Washington is subsidizing my research at Punta Tombo. In, also, we have funding from the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Global Penguin Society, a lot of uh, corporations, but mostly it's individuals that care about penguins and want to know what's happening. So that's why we know so much about them. One of the things that I first noticed when I went to the beaches at Punta Tombo is something was horribly wrong. There are all these penguins that were covered in oil. Some of them were totally black with oil, so you couldn't even see that they have white stomachs, usually. Some of them were mummified and had been on the beaches for I didn't know how long, but clearly months. 
Some of them were, had ring around the collar. They just had oil around their neck where they'd come up through it. Where were they getting all that in oil? But what I did know is that was another externality. Penguins were paying with their lives for ballast water that had been dumped into the ocean. Well, the ballast water that's dumped in the ocean with oil in it is because tankers were going from way far up north in Argentina all the way down past the penguin colony at Punta Tombo. And when they were going down, they were empty. So they took in seawater. And before they got to the oil port where they could put oil into the tanker, they just dumped the seawater at, at sea. And that seawater had some oil in it. And these penguins that you see on the screen ended up swimming through that oil, and they paid with their lives. But that's an externality. Does the consumer pay for that? Does the oil company pay for that? No, it's free. And so what it meant for the tankers is that they got to spend an, a less than a, they got to save a day from going into port. They also could toss it into the environment and they didn't have to pay for treating it. So those were all free to the oil company and to the tankers, but they're not free to the penguins. Those externalities are a huge problem for us. One of the things that we need to know is the true cost of what we do to the environment, to wildlife, etc. We don't have a true cost administration or a real cost administration, but we should have one. We've got the, Fe the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, we all think that the FDA is important because we don't want to be able to take a pill and find out that it's going to kill us. We want to know what the side effects are. And of course, every evening on TV, you hear the side effects. They tell you, oh, take this pill. You might have shortness of breath. It could be like an elephant sitting on your, on your chest, or it may be that uh, you die from a stroke. Um, but uh, ask your doctor, and you'll have a healthy, healthy life. But the point is, the FDA regulates these things so that we know that we're reasonably safe. There are many things that have changed to help get our accounting system somewhat better. For example, smoking. We know that secondary smoke harms your health. Nobody's smoking in this room, nobody smokes on planes anymore. So we want to protect non-smokers from smoking. Nevertheless, our accounting system is still needs to be fixed more. In the state of Washington, if you're a non-smoker, you get actually $25 credit if you're a state employee on your health insurance. But we know that non-smokers are subsidizing smokers because of the cost to your health if you smoke. Some of these things are moving in the right direction, but we need to know the science behind it. It took a long time to get it on, on smoking. We need transparency and we need communication. So we need to know those true costs. In some cases, you wouldn't even need to worry about the true costs because if we just hooked up the exhaust pipe from your car right directly into the driver's seat, there'd be no problem with externalities. So we need to know what these externalities are. They need to be transparent, and we need to communicate them. We've done that to some extent with our labeling on food. If you buy a package of potato chips, you know half the fat in those potato chips come from fat. Half the calories in those potato chips come from fat. And you also know what the calories are. Doesn't mean you're not going to buy the potato chips. You're likely to buy the potato chips and eat them, but at least you know. And that's why we need a real cost administration. We need to know what the real costs are. And if we did, we could have a conscious economy. And we'd all do better. Why do we have an FDA? Because none of us want to figure out what the effects of all these pills are. We need the same thing for our, our economy with um, the real costs. One penguin named Rapolo really taught me the cost of pollution. Rapolo was oiled not once, but twice. His first time was in 2002, he got oiled in Uruguay. He was washed, he got a ban put on him, because uh, the people asked for a ban to put on um, Rapolo. I didn't meet Rapolo until five years later. In 2007, Rapolo showed up on the beach right below the Mar de Plata Aquarium. In all the places in Argentina, that's the only, one of the few places, almost the only place, that a penguin could show up and get rehabilitated. When he was found on the rocks right below the aquarium, he only weighed a little bit, 2.7 kilos, so a little over five pounds. He was starving to death. If he'd been out much longer, he would have died from starvation. 
He was rehabilitated, and over a month later, he gained another two kilos, so another five pounds. He almost doubled his weight, and we put a satellite tag on his back. And you can see the satellite tag here. We actually glue it on and put it on with tape, and he's got a little antenna, and he uh, is tracked by a satellite. And so we wanted to know, where was Rapolo getting into oil? Where did he actually go? And here are six rehabilitated penguins that had satellite tracks, uh, tags on them, and they're tracking. You can see some of them stayed north. You can see Skugar went way south. So did Joel. But Rapolo, he went the furthest south of any of them. He went even past Punta Tombo, so way past some of the breeding colonies. We also know that penguins don't breed until they're like about four or five, even seven years old. Rapolo had to be at least seven, because when he was first oiled, he was still an adult. So we know now that this is the track. Look at, they go between several countries, so it's not just Argentina, it's Uruguay and Brazil as well. So you have to have international uh, agreement on how to deal with this problem. Well, we were really interested in how many penguins were being oiled at Punta Tombo. So my Argentine students and I started walking beaches. We walked over 24 kilometers of beach every year in March. Penguin chicks fledge, so those are fledglings that you see on the uh, graph. These lighter blue are fledglings, and these darker blue are adults that are oiled. And we walked these beaches and counted how many dead penguins we saw, and then determined how many of them had oil on them. And you can see in some of these years, over 80% of the adults that we found dead on the beach were covered in, covered in oil. Just the ones that we counted, we counted more than 3,200 penguins that were dead on the beach. And we went to the government and said, this is a real problem. Penguins are being oiled. And the government said, no, no, that doesn't happen here in Argentina. We have laws. People don't put any oil into the environment because we have laws here. So we had eight years of data. Who pays for that data? Again, it's interested people like you. Sometimes even corporations will help briefly. And we can walk those beaches and see how many penguins were oiled. And you can see in some years in terms of fledglings, more than half of the fledglings were oiled. And they'd only been out in the ocean for less than two months. So oil was a big problem. It took 15 years, but 15 years later, the tanker lanes were moved 40 kilometers further offshore. And the effects on the penguins were dramatic. Suddenly, we didn't get nearly as many oiled penguins. In fact, we found less than 25 in all those years after. And in fact, last year, we saw no penguins um, oiled at Punta Tombo. So, <laughs> Oil spills are occurring, chronic exposure is a problem. We think we've been able to fix it. But penguins at Punta Tombo are still, their populations are going down about 1% a year. Other things are much more difficult to see, like climate change. It's hard to put the finger on that because most of us drive cars and we don't have the tailpipe hooked up to the exhaust, so it's a little more difficult to get the blame here. But we know that at Punta Tombo and many other places, storms have increased, rainfall has increased, and there's increased variability. And if any of you have lived through Tr Katrina or Sandy, you know what one of these events can do. Well, the same thing can happen to Magellanic penguins. And every year, some penguins die from um, predation, this pink line across here. In some years, not in all years, but in some years, penguins die because they get too hot, because the environment's too hot, just like heat waves in Europe can kill people. But in some years, one storm can really do a lot of damage to penguins, and in fact, can kill half the chicks. We know that about 65% of all chicks die. 40% die from starvation. But in some years, storms can kill half the chicks. That can have a big effect on penguins. There are other things that we know are likely. For example, we know that commercial fishing removes prey. And we know that 40% of the chicks die from starvation at Punta Tombo. If we could just have a marine protected area around Punta Tombo where the adults are going to forage for their small chicks for two months a year, we could probably increase the survival of chicks and not have nearly as many die from starve, starvation. Commercial fishing removes prey. We know, for example, in the Antarctic Peninsula, last year in uh, 2013 and 14, 210,000 metric tons of krill were removed. What eats krill? Penguins, seals, whales. How much is 210,000 metric tons? About worth the weight of over 77,000 hummers. 
Shouldn't we know the true cost when you buy those omega-3 pills and other things that the krill have gone to feed chickens or farm-raised salmon? We can do something about this in terms of mediation. We can have marine protected areas and areas zoned that can protect our wildlife. But we have to fix the accounting system. We really need something like a real cost administration. We're moving in the right direction with fair, with fair trade, with uh, sustainable seafood, but it takes a lot of knowledge from the consumer. So just like we've taken having to know a lot about drugs away from each one of us, we want to know the real cost of what we buy. We have to make sure that pollution is no longer free or subsidized. We have to make sure that our accounting includes the long-term view of costs. And more importantly, we have to change our government laws so that our choices that we make and we subsidize, like we tax tobacco, uh, we tax liquor, we want to make our accounting system be reflective of what we think is good in preventing environmental destruction and wildlife destruction. If we do, because people don't get to, because people vote, but penguins don't get to vote, here's a penguin that says, here, take this and give it back to the man. I don't need your corrupt society anymore. Penguins are paying our bills, and people need to be conscious of who is paying our bills, and we don't need all these externalities. And with that, the Penguins and I thank you and I hope you think differently about the real costs and ask our politicians to have a real cost administration. Thank you very much.